Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance in hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, uh, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope everybody is feeling good and warm and merry and bright. Yes? Well, I'm about to ruin it all for you in this video. No, I'm just kidding. I hope you guys are all doing well. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a situation that went viral on TikTok a few years ago, actually right in the heart, in the middle of like lockdowns and stuff like that. And so everybody was on their phones. Everybody was looking for something to do. I swear, I let my son use a tablet more than he's ever used in his entire life during those times. And I felt so guilty, but also at the same time, it's like, what else are they supposed to do? At the time, we didn't think we were supposed to like go and hang out with each other or do other things. And so therefore there was a lot of inside tablet time. And then on June 19th of 2020, there was a video that went completely viral of these teenagers that were using this app called Randonautica. Okay. Now this app is an app. I don't know if you guys have ever done geocaching. Me and my family have done geocaching. My husband has actually taken our oldest son, Jordan, who is now in the military. And next month, he'll actually be 22 years old. He took him geocaching years ago. And what that is, it's like an app. It tells you where to go, like within the coordinates of where you're standing. And you go and look for some sort of treasure and you sign your name on this thing. And then it's really fun. It's actually really fun. It's like finding buried treasures in your town or if you're traveling in a different town. Well, this Rando Nautica app is kind of similar, except for you, like you download the app the way I'm understanding it. You download the app and then you like manifest something, you know, people were manifesting, like said that they were manifesting money so that they were manifesting, like just all different kinds, uh, kinds of stuff. Well, these teenagers in June of 2020 were sent to this location in Seattle, down by the water, down by a bridge, and this is where they found this suitcase. You can just imagine, you find a suitcase sitting on the rocks by the water, and most people, I know me, think, oh my gosh, it's a suitcase full of like treasure, money, you know, I'm about to be rich, right? You find a suitcase, when they got down close to the suitcase, they were overwhelmed by a smell, a smell that they said traumatized them and that they could never get out of their heads. They went over jokingly and used a stick. They unzipped it real quick, filmed the whole thing for TikTok, unzipped it real quick, flipped it open, and there was a black garbage bag in it with something. It looked packed very tight. And then in the video, the young man that was filming said that they were calling 911. It pans over and shows the girl calling 911. They waited for the cops to come. And then they said that they were hoping that it was just like rotten food in this suitcase, baking in the sun in the middle of summer. But it wasn't. It wasn't rotten food in that suitcase. Now, one of the bags was found on the shoreline near a popular tourist attraction, Pike's Place Market. And then later, another bag was found floating in the water nearby. Now, again, the teens are using this app where they're supposed to imagine what they want. And the app tells them to go to this place. And then they go and find this stinky suitcase. Now it is said that these teens waited for over two hours for the cops to get there. And although you guys know I am a supporter, my and my family are huge supporters of our law enforcement. You guys have heard me in different cases and videos be 
frustrated with different investigative teams on different cases, like the Brian Laundry, Gabby Petito situation or the Kylie Rodney situation. But in this case, I don't think the cops taking two hours to get there over a stinky suitcase was that big of a deal, especially during this time, because in Seattle, they were having that like ground zero stuff going on. So they had their hands full with that. And for them to come to a bunch of teenagers saying that they found a smelly suitcase, they were not in a big rush. But when they got there and the cops that know very well the distinct smell of decomposing flesh knew that there was something in that suitcase in that black bag that was not food. That same day, detectives released a statement saying detectives are currently investigating after several bags containing human remains were located near the water in the 1100 block of Alki Avenue this afternoon. Then later on June 30th, the detective statement would say that they identified a 27 year old male and a 37 year old female. The remains were of a 36-year-old Jessica Lewis and her 27-year-old boyfriend, Austin Warner. The coroner would determine that they were beaten and shot and dismembered around June 9th of 2020. Then they were stuffed into the suitcases and it was also determined that Jessica had been seven times, but Austin had only been shot once. Jessica and Austin had been together for eight years and Austin went by the nickname Cash. Jessica worked at an adult care home with her family and had four children. It was said that Austin had a small child at the time under the age of 10 and that Jessica's children were mostly grown, but nevertheless, the two of them were madly in love. It seemed that they had a bit of an on again, off again relationship like typically young people do sometimes, but that they loved each other very, very much. On August 20th, police were able to make an arrest. In a statement, they said that a 62 year old man is in custody for the murder of the two people after their remains were located in West Seattle in June. On Wednesday afternoon, detectives arrested the suspect at his residence. He was interviewed and then booked into the King County Jail. The man arrested was 62 year old Michael Lee Dudley. Now, when people popped his photo up, it came as a bit of a shock. This was the guy that the couple was renting a room from. Now, allegedly, they were to pay this guy $1,500 a month to rent a room. Like, I don't know what kind of room that was. Then again, Seattle, Washington. I mean, maybe in the heart of like downtown LA in Bel Air or something like that, but nevertheless, $1,500 a month. When people saw this guy, Michael Lee Dudley, they began to think that there's no way that this could be the person that was responsible for overtaking this young couple, doing what was done to them, dismembering them, being able to put them in the suitcases, get rid of them and all of that. Until they started looking into Michael's past. Now, he has quite the criminal history. Allegedly. Allegedly, he was arrested back in the 90s for like stealing cars and da 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 da. And then moving up, there was some trafficking charges or some possession charges. There was even a person that came forward and claimed that Michael had posted that same exact room online for Airbnb and that they had been to his house. He was the nicest old man, but weird things were happening in the house. Like one time they left their window open and they came back and there was like a chicken in their room because he had chickens, but nothing too strange or out of the ordinary. But then it was brought up about a case of Michael's daughter. Allegedly, Michael had a history of essay and insight. His daughter actually filed an essay restraining order against him in June of 2018. The document accused Michael of essaying his daughter for nearly a decade, from the age of 10 all the way until 18, by drugging me and then R-wording me. And then she went and files this restraining order against him. And this is in 2018, so this is just two years that she files this restraining order before his arrest of this situation with his two roommates. Michael's daughter also said in the statement that he would force her to sleep in the bed with him and he would pleasure himself in front of her and make her watch him. Why didn't they just go and arrest him right then and there? Like, I don't understand that. 
whether she was filing a restraining order or not, they should have investigated it, which by the way, they turned her restraining order down. They said, you can't file a restraining order for this. That's a DV situation. Y'all are family members. And so they did absolutely nothing, which unbelievable. Un, at the very least, they should have investigated it. Now, Jessica's aunt, Jessica being the female victim, she came forward and said that she was very close with the couple before they passed, and she was very familiar with Michael and said that her knowledge of Michael more or less tracks with the allegations made by his daughter. The aunt says that sometimes Michael would even break their car so they could not leave. Like, this literally should have been made into a horror movie. This is so scary. This is so freaky, right? Looking just like an old 60 something year old man that's got all this dark history and is letting people rent rooms from them as an Airbnb. Y'all better be careful doing that too, by the way. Like, no shame to all of y'all that have Airbnbs that rent rooms, but. I'm just saying be careful. The aunt also said that he would put trackers on people's cars and anytime he ever got into a dispute with anybody, he would tell them to leave but try to lock them in the house. Michael also allegedly had another disturbing habit of cruelty towards animals that couldn't protect themselves. Jessica's aunt said that he once killed a dog in front of them and then left the carcass outside for three days to scare them. And the couple had nowhere to go. And that's why they stayed there. He's a freaking psycho, said the aunt. And if all of that wasn't bad enough, one of Michael's ex-girlfriends came forward and said that he was very violent as well too. It's like, I... It's like, I just wish this young couple would have called the cops on him for beating an animal. I I'm telling you, I don't care who you are. If you are my family, my child, my husband, which it would never be in the name of Jesus or any of y'all's, and you hit a dog like, like, I don't understand how this man kept getting away with stuff. And then we ended up here. And after he was arrested, he was charged with two counts of murder in the second degree and was held on a $5 million bail. After obtaining a search warrant, the police searched the house where the three lived and discovered bullet holes in the wall, blood in the couple's room, and a fresh coat of paint. They said it was obvious that the room had just been cleaned. And while serving the warrant, neighbors contacted detectives and said that they had called 911 to report hearing gunfire from within the house on June. June 9th. They allegedly also heard a man yelling, please don't do this. Just let me leave. That is so devastating to think about. And you think about the girl, Jessica, or the young woman, Jessica, who had seven bullet holes in her. And he's saying, please don't, please don't do this. Just let me leave. Like what kind of, what was he doing? Like, was he torturing them? Was he taunting him? Was he hurting her in front of him? Like he was begging for his life. Man, that just sucks. That's so sad. Records show that the police had responded to the house call at around 7.15 p.m., but left the residence a short time later when nobody answered the door. Like, yeah, who's going to answer the door? Like, ding dong, police, everybody okay in there? Like, he's in the back doing what he's doing, right? And the two are not breathing anymore. And what is he going to do? Come out and open the door? Yeah, sure, everything's fine. No, he's going to be quiet. Like, <sighs> During an interview, Michael allegedly told investigators that Jessica had somehow managed to cut herself, but the police say that he couldn't quite account for the bullet holes. So he was arrested immediately after the interrogation. And I really hope they release that interrogation footage. I don't know how they do it in Seattle, Washington, but I would like to see it. I'd like to see what he said and how he said it. However, Michael did admit that he got into an argument with the couple because they weren't paying rent. And then that's when he told them that they were supposed to pay him $1,500 a month to rent a place there while he's, you know, a animals and doing all this other kind of weird stuff, breaking their car, like really just taking advantage of two people that were in a bad situation who obviously had issues. Okay. They obviously had issues and a hard time. And then you're also thinking about during that time in 2020, it was just such a, a hard time. People were terrified from the whole CV-19 situation. It, it just, it was a lot. And now they're living in their own personal 
in this house with this old man. Now the court documents say while a precise motive is still not known, the evidence to date shows that Michael was angry with the victims for not paying the rent and for bringing potential criminal activity to his home. Michael, likely with the aid of others, dismembered the two victims after he did what he did to them, then separated their bodies into multiple bags and suitcases and tried to hide them in different bodies of water. This process would have taken a lot of time and effort and his willingness to take these extra extreme steps demonstrates the threat that he poses to the community. A witness who was friends with Michael said that she moved her belongings into Michael's residence on June 9th. Then this witness, who we do not know what her name is as of now, it's been kept confidential, said that she took a shower and then she went upstairs and went into the bedroom that she was going to be staying in. She told the investigators that in the middle of the room was a heaping pile of laundry, but she said she could see the figure of a person under the clothes and could see a bloody hand sticking out. This witness then said that she went to Michael and made like a joke to him out of fear, like, golly, that room's dirty in there. Probably could be a dead body in there. I don't know what the joke was, but she allegedly made some sort of joke. And she said that later that night, Michael asked her if she had somewhere to go for the night because he needed to clean up that mess that's in the room. That's when she said she left the residence. Now, Michael had a bail hearing on March 3rd of 2021, where his lawyers asked for his bail to be reduced from 5 million to 500,000, but the judge denied his request. This trial has been postponed so many times, and I have been so frustrated because I keep looking, trying to get an update, like this is 2022, we're about to be in 2023, and the trial keeps getting postponed and we haven't heard anything yet. And I'm really hoping that this man, if he's guilty of this, if he's guilty of any of this, the stuff with his daughter or whatever, that he never gets out again. Because it's very terrifying to think about, like, what happened. Now, the, the thing that I think is going to be the hang up in court with this guy is, according to, like, the coroners or the investigators, the way that these two bodies were dismembered shows evidence that it was probably done by more than one person. But you know what? We've seen cases like that before where one person gets a different tool, like they use different tools, and therefore it can seem like it's more than one person when really it is just one person. I, I don't know. I don't know who would help him. I don't see anybody helping him. Nevertheless, I think that that is something that the defense is going to use and it's nerve wracking. Now let's talk about some of the theories and the rumors that are out there about this case. It's rumored that Jessica and Austin are not Michael's first victims. It's rumored that he has done things like this before. There's no proof to back that rumor, but that's what the rumor is. And it is also rumored that this Michael had a basement under his house that he did not allow anybody to go in. It was also said that Austin had told a family member before that in that basement, he snuck down there one time and saw this weird like drainage system that he had, which could mean that he saw too much and that's why Michael had to take him out. That is so scary and creepy to think about, but it could be true. And then the other creepy thing about this story is it is said that the teens that were using this Rananautica app, and remember how we were talking about in the beginning that it's all about like manifesting, they were trying to manifest money, you know, cash money. And Austin's name was Austin, but he went by cash. So that is creepy in itself as well. So what do you guys think? I, I, I mean, I think there's no doubt about it in my personal opinion that this Michael is guilty. It's just so sad that they were living there. What do y'all think? Let me know in the comment section down below. Other than that, you guys, thank y'all so much for watching this video. I love you guys, and I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye.